Sinjay. The hot issue this week, obviously, is the nullification of the anti-homosexuality law. Mm -hmm. And according to an article carried in the New York Times, Professor Sylvia Tamale, who is a colleague of yours, mm -hmm. is quoted to have said shortly after the ruling, and I quote, We are very happy, but it's unfortunate that the court did not deal with the substantive issues that violate our rights. Mm -hmm. Why did court avoid discussing this substantive issue, which Professor Tamale says infringes on a fundamental human right? Mm -hmm. Um, there are a number of reasons why courts do this. Um, it's called a question of, it's actually called judicial avoidance. Others call it judicial minimalism, whereby the court gives a decision, but gives a decision based on a narrow technical point, or it can be a legal question, a substantive one, but which is one out of five, and then dispose of the suit or the matter without really dealing with the core of the question. The, there are too many, two major reasons I can find. One is where the question is a difficult one, and it happens. We, we uh, Judges are erudite, they are learned, but there are some difficult questions they face. Okay. Uh, in Uganda, one difficult question is the application of international law in Uganda, in Uganda's domestic system. And I've found that in a lot of those cases, if not all of them, which touch on this question, judges avoid it using, so they decide the case using narrow contract law, question under our law, and then just, just avoid touching the question of international law, which might be a wise thing to do, other than getting it wrong. The other question is where it deals with the controversial question. Um, I think this is the, just one of the most recent examples, but it's not a new one. Um, when the question of promoting sectarianism uh, mm -hmm. under the penal code, I think it's section 41 was raised in um, the East African media case, the court said, and I quote, we find nothing unconstitutional about it. So in just one line, using a substantive decision, but just based on one paragraph, they dispose of that entire petition dealing with the constitutionality of section 41 of the penal code because they just didn't want to deal with the question of sectarianism, ethnicity, and how that, you know, um, fits in with Article 29 of the Constitution. Okay. Now, so now, so when it comes to homosexuality, I think they just, it's just a, it's a question of, let's, if we can find a way of dealing with it without dealing with it, let's do that. Let's, let's do that. Yeah. And let's turn to the basis of this, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, nullification. Mm -hmm. The issue of quorum. Mm -hmm. The petitioner's uh, support to their claim mm -hmm. was that there was no quorum and basically what they presented was the handset mm -hmm. and this was the basis of the court's ruling mm -hmm. in your opinion was this substantive mm -hmm. evidence well there are two questions that the petition has presented there's all two core things that they were asking the court to determine one was how the act was passed mm -hmm. and the question of what was in that act so the question of quorum was dealt with the how part and uh, and, and and so th at the end of the day the court says that there was no quorum established by the speaker in spite of this being brought to her attention and that because of that irregularity alone that was a nullity that went to the heart of the law and did not fit within article 88 and 94 of the constitution and in that respect therefore i think the petitioners sustained their their case and i think the court also struck a very good blow for the autonomy of parliament and how parliamentary power is supposed to be exercised. And that was in keeping with previous cases of Smogeri and Zachary Loom and a whole host of jurisprudence. But just, just to say that there is a problem here that goes beyond this, this Bahati case, the so homosexuality case, that Article 88 in the past, before the 2005 amendment, was very clear that the quorum for parliament for voting was one third of all members present. Okay. Now, strangely, in 2005, that was changed. And now it says, under Article 88, that the quorum shall be determined by rules of parliament. That's extremely dangerous. It's extremely yes. dangerous because the parliament for, um, it's not inconceivable the parliament can determine that quorum shall be a tenth for members present, which is strange that Ugandans would elect a parliament and only one tenth would pass a rule. But be that as it may, parliament in its own rules of procedure have said that in this particular matter of voting, it's still one third and the rules of procedure for this, in, in this particular case. And the rules of procedure say that if the matter of quorum is brought to the, the attention of the speaker, the speaker must ascertain that quorum. And the speaker, in this case, three members of parliament brought it to the attention of the speaker, including the Honorable Prime Minister. And she ignored this question. So that, that level of impunity is what the court was, was, dealing, was dealing with. with. And it even goes to the question of the secrecy within which this law was passed. But the questions of national laws cannot be by surprise. There was no expectation that this could be on the, on the order paper, but it seems that one side knew. So you found pastors in the galleries. And the other mm -hmm. side of the, the liberal persons, the human rights activists, the homosexuals in Uganda, were not aware. Not so this question of passing laws by surprise, I think, is the court did not touch on it, but I think it's so very core to what the court was saying. Okay, um, perhaps <coughs> those keen on expanding 
uh, legal jurisprudence believe that the Constitutional Court missed an opportunity to put to test the perceived clauses in the anti-homosexuality yes. bill yeah. that violate the Bill mm -hmm. of Rights. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with this? I agree with it very much, but I, there's also an explanation for that. Um, so the how question the court has dealt with, the what question, the question of the substantive question really, is what the court avoided. Now, there is a question about the controversy of this question. Now, the court said, and I quote, that dealing with, having dealt with the quorum question and found the court that the law was unconstitutional in that, in that respect, they need not have dealt, dealt then with, with the questions of discrimination, uh, privacy, etc., etc., and they said that would be an academic exercise. Now, of course, as, as an academic myself, what does I find that really that a mean? bit offensive. <laughs> so they're basically saying that, you know, we have dealt with it. Now, practically speaking, the law is dead, so there's no need. So it will be an exercise in, in mootness, just almost like a discussion, you know. So we don't have to do that as a court. We have dealt with the question on this point, and this point disposes of the case. But that's very problematic because what the court essentially has said, that you didn't pass this law with quorum, what that means is that parliament, there's nothing that stops the parliament from passing the law again with quorum. Which they plan on doing which right now. You know, and, uh, and the problem with that is the court hasn't given us guidance as to what the parliament is allowed to pass, what will be constitutional. And in this case, this would, be the, would have been a, a wonderful opportunity for the court to guide us and tell us, look, you can do this under the constitution, this is what you can do, this, this, you can't do this. But again, I'm not surprised at the parliament that the court avoided this. It has been the trend taken by African courts on this question. Um, mm -hmm. In Botswana, in the case of Kanane versus the state, the court basically said it's not yet time, our society is not ready with, to deal with homosexuality. So they found, just with that statement, they avoided the important constitutional sure. questions under the Botswana constitution. In Zimbabwe also, in Banana versus the state, the court essentially said the same thing, society is not ready. Again, avoided mm -hmm. dealing with the real constitutional questions. So the court in Uganda, has just followed in the line of African decisions that talk about time and whether society is ready. Only that here the court did it without saying it's doing that. So it didn't really say. I think their feeling is let's buy time. Let's buy time uh, to allow this dialogue to continue. Let's buy this time by deciding this point, this controversial point, this, this hot question on a narrow point that even Ugandans across the aisle can agree with. Because all sides, I think basically Ugandans of goodwill will say the court has come to the right decision in spite of one's feelings about the act. So I think the court has been a little bit um, perhaps prudent in this respect, but at the same time perhaps coward, uh, um, cowardly. <laughs> cowardly. In, in this, yes. Okay, this decision seems to have left political actors, especially the president, caught between a rock and mm -hmm. a hard place, quite literally. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, the president is likely to placate the West, which mm -hmm. is angry with the bill. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, mm -hmm. the president wants, may want to associate with the law mm -hmm. so that he gains traction in mm -hmm. the... No, with the masses. Mm -hmm. Is there a way out of this tight spot that he finds himself in? I actually think the president has found a way. Um, there, are, there are things I'm not at liberty to say, but okay. it could be, you know, the, the outcome is a win-win, apparently, because um, those who oppose the law find this now null and void. Those who the were for the law. law can still pass it. So it's a win-win and it just comes out of the time that the president is going to attend the summit, the, the U.S.-Africa summit, where he can now tell the U.S. president that, look, we have a functioning judiciary that has struck down this law and what you're complaining about is now finished. And then, of course, once it's back and after two years or a year and a half, the law can still be passed. So it seems to be a very convenient uh, moment for the president to um, both um, appear to be following constitutionalism rule of law at the same time meeting his political objectives. And in this regard, it's a little bit suspicious. Now, <laughs> using, the, using what is publicly available, it's a little bit suspicious, the timing of this decision, given that there are a number of other petitions which are pending in the court, dealing with the Anti-Pornography Act, dealing with the Public Order Management Act, that this petition has been fast-tracked. It, the hearing was about a month away. It's pulled forward. You find the state attorney saying that I don't have time, I didn't prepare for this, and you find the judge of the constitutional court saying, proceed. Yeah. It's almost the first time that you find the court being almost um, uh, a, li a little bit hostile to the government side on such a very important question. That is subs uh, very suspicious. I can't help but ask the question. Uh, yeah. We know that laws are to some extent shaped by international law yeah. and expectations. Yeah. How is this likely to influence the anti-gay legislation? I, I think judges of the Constitutional Court in Uganda will be insular rather than look outward. 
Um, the question of international law and, uh, and the experience of the community uh, have been expressed, even in Uganda here, uh, most especially by, in the case by Professor Kanyehamba, uh, Justice Kanyehamba, in Banco Arab de Espanol, where he said, look, our courts must respond to international law. And also in the Kigula case, where Gon Antende, now just of appeal, also said the same thing. So, but those are very few examples. By and large, courts have looked inward rather than outward. And especially in such a controversial question, I expect that judges will argue points of society. Um, yeah. And in this respect, they have certain constitutional provisions that support that. And that go on to the six, for instance, it says judges um, derive their power from the people of Uganda and must exercise judicial power in accordance with the norms, values, and aspirations of the people of Uganda. But of course, that comes after saying in accordance with the law and then with those things. Then the other things. But of course, the question now becomes um, about judges not, uh, not insulated from popular opinion. One hopes that they will use the same provision of the Constitution because our Constitution itself, even without looking to the US or the international law, has enough provisions to support the human rights of everyone in the country. The question is whether they would have the courage to take us to the promise of the Constitution. Okay, and maybe a, a final question to wrap up this discussion. How can we address public fears that led to the enactment of this act in the first place and find a middle ground for the conservatives and the human rights, human rights activists? That's very if there is a middle ground, that I is. think and it's a very important question because for so long it's, it's polarized. You're either for or against. or against. You know, you cannot try to, you know, talk about some balance. But I think inevitably, this is one of the questions that will have to be dealt with through dialogue, constitutional dialogue, and the struggle approach to human rights. I don't quite think that any court decision, whether it came out for or against the bill, ultimately will be the end of the matter. Ultimately, Ugandans must struggle through process of dialogue and counter dialogue. That would not so any decision, even if it came out in a year from now, will not be the end of this conversation. It's just the beginning rather than the end, and it's for us as a country through a long process of contestation, abusing each other, fighting over these things to come up with some sort of conclusion. So it can't come before it will come after the fact. Perfect way to end this discussion. Thank you for joining us on Talk of the Nation Always tonight. Always a pleasure. That was constitutional law on Dr. Basinja Kabumba joining us on Talk of the Nation to discuss the reactions to the nullification of the anti-homosexuality law.